on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Nobody posts typically their bad day on Facebook. In, in podcasts like this or just in, in looking at somebody's journey from the outside and you see them being successful, it's like the old adage of the iceberg, right? Where you just see the tip of the iceberg. You don't see right. all the work that happens underneath, all the preparation, yeah. all of the stuff that goes into what makes a successful entrepreneur that's under the water or under the surface. The biggest advice that I can give to other entrepreneurs they're trying to build is just don't make the big mistake. It's okay to make mistakes, but you want to be calculated. You always do want to make sure that you balance yourself with what is the worst case scenario. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high-performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. All right, Chaz Wolf and Gathering the Kings. Today, I hope that you are prepared for an amazing story. We've got an entrepreneur who literally went from lemonade stand to selling millions of wristbands to restaurants galore to a food service company with 500 employees and, and a real estate guru to, to, to boot. I have an unbelievable story with Adam. We just got off the pod and it was incredible to hear all your story. Was it as good for you as it was for us? <laughs> Hey, it was awesome. I always love love telling the story and, and love encouraging other entrepreneurs. So thanks for having me. Well, that's exactly what you're going to get here. So strap in, get your uh, notebook and pen ready, because that's exactly what Adam does. He breaks down so many different things that are going to encourage you in your entrepreneurial journey. Get ready. Here we go. Adam Guy, welcome to the stage, my brother. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thanks, man. It's so funny. Uh, our relationship started so many years ago. And I remember, this is for the audience, because this is a perspective that you probably didn't even know, but Adam Guy was like the guy in high school, okay? He was the guy, a couple years older than me, the star of the basketball team. Like everybody really looked up to Adam Guy. Not only just was he the guy, but he was a really good guy. We're just a good dude, took care of people around him. I remember being a sophomore in the basketball team and uh, just being a part of your leadership at that point. And so... After all these years later, it feels like a decades later, we've come to the same King's table here today to extract your story, uh, things that you've been successful with. You've been uber successful in many areas. I'm totally jacked to, uh, to get your story here today. So thank you again for, for sharing with us today. Yeah, I'm excited about it. And I, I look back fondly on those Rockbridge High School, uh, the Rockbridge High School days, and, and certainly glad that's your perception of me from that time. But yeah, that was certainly a lot of fun and built Absolutely. a great foundation for what we do today. Absolutely. So tell us what you do today. What's your business? Uh, give us a little highlight of, of what you're into right now. Sure. So I am the uh, president and CEO of Upper Crust Food Service. And long story short, we are a contract food service management company. And that is a long way to say that we do not serve meals to the public, but rather we serve meals in contracted situations. Our number one kind of priority market is fraternity and sorority. And so that is our, our niche, if you will, yeah. uh, that we serve food in. That's fantastic. And so you've taken a long history of food because we'll get into your, your food pedigree, if you will, here shortly, but taking a long history and many hours and you found a niche that uh, has just incredibly blown up for you. And so we'll get into some of that, but tell us at this level where you've, you're at the, you're at the mark where everyone's attaining to be, you're doing enough revenue to where you're not the guy cooking any longer. And so the listener today is building a business. They're most likely a six figure business and they're in the grind, but when they get to your place, you're still driven. You're still growing the business. Tell us what drives you now. Well, I think it's just, it, it, it evolves over time. And I okay. think that's the thing as an entrepreneur, it's a journey. And I think that you really have to look at it as a really long journey. And honestly, it's a roller coaster ride. I think it that is. They're especially early on in your journey, you're going to have days where you wake up and you sign a big deal and you feel like you're going to be a millionaire tomorrow. And then you're going to find out that that deal wasn't quite what you thought that deal was. And yeah. next 
next thing, your biggest customer isn't working out and you think you're going to be bankrupt in a week. That, that journey, I think the biggest thing for me being an entrepreneur is like, you have to keep that even keel and you really have to look at it over the long run. And that means there's going to be a lot of sacrifices, especially early on in, in order to make it where you want to be. So for me, yeah. it's just a change in mindset as you grow your business to the point, everybody has to start by working in their business, right? right. You have to work in your business to understand your business and you have to work in your business to be able to look at any of your employees and say, I know how to do your job if I have to, right? Right. Um, and then once you've figured out how to work in it, that next transition is transitioning to working on it. And I think that's the hardest transition that uh, entrepreneurs face because it often comes with a lot of anxiety, right? Giving, giving up a piece of your little kingdom that you've built, uh, trusting other people with something that, that in your mind you might be able to do better uh, or quicker. That time that you spend making that transition Okay. will pay major dividends. So that has really, especially in the last five to seven years of my journey, it's really been about letting go, honestly, and hiring the right people and trusting them and trusting, but then verifying what I want done is, is getting, is being done. Yeah. So for the listener today, you've already just, you've, you just, you've taken us to the deep end already. It's fantastic. If you're taking notes, <clears throat> you need to first write down what he talked about is that it's the long game, right? So if you're trying to get rich today, good for you. But <laughs> if you're playing the long game, at the end of the day, if you find yourself, you're still pressing in and you haven't quite hit there yet, it's okay. Time's on your side. You want to be urgent today, but you want to understand that this is a long game. So thank you for that perspective, Adam. And, and so you're a little bit of time in and you're looking back a decade or probably even a couple of decades at this point, getting close to looking in your business journey going, wow. There were times where I was in the daily. There were times where I was growing a team, times where I was a little nervous about giving things away. And you can give us that perspective that you just did. So that's so great. So let's go back to some of those days where you were maybe more in the grind. Sure. Tell us about where entrepreneurship started for you. Obviously, I knew you before you were a business owner, and but you were a leader on the basketball team. So did leadership lead you to that? Did you already have leadership innate inside of you? Did you learn something after school? Like, where did it start? I think for me, it really started with having a really supportive family. I think that's something that I try to hold on to with my three kids today as I'm raising them is my parents always encouraged me when I had an idea to try it, right? Yeah. And yeah. just say, hey, you know what? Go do it. I mean, it, it, for me, it started with a, a lemonade stand on the corner of a prominent intersection before a co before college football games. Are you saying location, and, location, location, Adam? No. <laughs> yeah, it was a great location. Honestly, like I, I was learning that at five years old. Like, yeah. hey, I picked this location where thousands of fans were going to be walking past me. And, and this is, I mean, going back to entrepreneurship one-on-one, -on -one, the lemonade stand. I would make it for a five-year-old, we'd make a hundred bucks doing a lemonade oh. stand on a game weekend and I was rich. But for me, just seeing that happen and then tweaking that. I remember moving my stand to where I, I saw there was going to be more people and yeah. making sure that I had enough product because the first week I, I sold all my lemonade and it was gone. And so next week I had to make sure I had more for the next game. And I, I just remember that excitement of leaving the game early yeah. because I needed to get to my stand to set things up so I didn't miss customers as they left the game. And so that was really where I think I sort of just got the bug, right? Hey, sure. This is fun. This is cool. And this is something I can figure out. And even at age five, something that I'm somewhat competent at, or I kind of just innately yeah. have an ability to understand. And then I moved into, uh, actually, this is a, a fun fact about me that not many people know, but I, okay. I moved into, uh, I, I was an, a magician and an illusionist. That's right. And so at age seven, I did my first magic show. I grabbed my sister who was six at the time. And I said, Hey, you're my assistant. Come over to the retirement home with me. And we're going to do, a, we're going to do a magic show. And I think just my parents, like, I think about so many people, parents that when their kids says, Hey, I want to go do a magic show. Can you help me right. figure out where to do this? And my parents connected me with this retirement home to go do a magic show. I feel like there's so many of us as parents that would say, you know what? I'm busy with work. I'm busy right. with my life. I'm busy with my stuff. I don't have time to set my seven-year-old kid up to go embarrass himself in front of a bunch <laughs> of old people. But what happened was that audience was incredible because I got done. I tell this all the time. My, we had some music that played in our magic show. And so we got done with the magic show and this little old lady came up to me and she grabbed my hands and she said, son, that was the best 
music I have ever heard in my life. And she thought we were singing and we were musicians, not right. Music. <laughs> and so this, this retirement home audience was the perfect audience for my 100%. first foray. So we took that business and uh, I just kind of got the bug. And, yeah. and for me, what's fun too, is when I was performing, I could become a version of myself that I had invented. I could go up and, and I wasn't maybe the most outgoing guy to just go up and, and, and start a conversation with someone I didn't know. But if I was on a stage in front of a thousand people doing something that I was confident in, something I knew I was good at, something that I had prepared and practiced and planned for a good result. I had this confidence, right? For an eight, nine, 10 year old kid doing a show for a thousand people in a theater, that, that was something that really built my confidence as an entrepreneur because I wasn't making a fortune, but people were paying me, right? Yeah. To, to come and do something that I really enjoy. So that was where I think it started for me. Yeah. So we yeah. did those shows all the way until I was in college and had a great little business going, not a legitimate business per se. There's a lot of stuff that I was just, you know, I was just running. I, we had shows. I couldn't drive my car yet. My parents were driving me and dropping <laughs> me off. But then I got started. Once I got into college, I started my first legitimate business, which was an online. We sold silicone wristbands back in the Lance Armstrong craze. That's right. Yep. I remember. Um, and I think that's a great example of just taking an idea. So I saw these wristbands. You couldn't even, there was like a underground market for charity wristbands. So I was driving in the car and I told my dad, I said, I'm going to make some of these wristbands for our local college and I'm going to make them black and gold. I'm going to write go tigers on them and I'm going to sell these things. And so he of course was supportive of the idea, but I was using my money that, that I had made through my magic shows. And good entrepreneurs are always willing to push the envelope just a little bit. So I ordered 10,000 of these wristbands. Wow. Okay. So uh, how old are you here? Okay. I am a, so a sophomore in college. Okay. All right. So yeah. 20. So I'm yeah, 20 years old. So sophomore in college, I ordered 10,000 of these wristbands. Everybody in my family says, hey, this is a great idea, Adam, but don't you think you should start off with 500 wristbands? Right? <laughs> like, do you yeah. think you should see if this works? Well, I already understood that the price of buying 500 versus the price of buying 10,000 was dramatically different. So if I was going to make any money on this, I needed to go for the 10,000 where I yeah. could make a bunch of money. I ordered these. They came in from this manufacturer in China. It was actually, he was in California, promotional products company. The product came from China. I get the product and I go and I, I, I solicited all of my fraternity brothers. Uh, so this is my first sales team. Uh, <laughs> so I went and I said, hey guys, I got a great opportunity for you. So we went out in five degree weather and we plastered every single car with a flyer with a PayPal website back in the day. Oh, wow. All right. And uh, so we plastered probably six or 7,000 cars during a basketball game at the okay. university. I went out with my buddies, went out to have fun that night. It was like a Thursday night. Uh, we went downtown. We had some fun. We came back. This PayPal account was connected to my student email. So when I got back, when I woke up in the morning, the next morning, I opened up my student email to do some homework and I had 6,000 new emails. Okay. In my inbox. <laughs> and every single email was a confirmation of an order from PayPal. Wow. So we, we sold all 10,000 wristbands overnight. Wow. So now I've got this really big problem because I didn't think about the fact that each one of these people were buying like one or two or three wristbands. So now I got to oh, yeah. shoot these out to all these people. Right. <laughs> so now I go, so now I go back to my fraternity brothers and I'm, do I have a job for you guys? Instead of study hall, yep. I will pay you to help me stuff envelopes. Yep. And it gives me an appreciation when you're waiting on product that hasn't arrived oh, yeah. uh, from a startup company, because we literally were in the cafeteria of our fraternity house, stuffing envelopes with wristbands. And I think it took us like a month to actually package and ship out all 10,000 of these wristbands. Wow. Um, but that's really what got me started. And I ended up selling that business. So that was the first transaction I ever had was another person that was in the promotional products world. Sure. Uh, we, we ended up selling tens of millions of wristbands um, to people all over the country. And so we had a legitimate little business. And so he bought that from me. Yeah. Um, and like any good person that's... Um, 21 years old and just sold their first business. I think I got dropped on my head at some point when I was a kid and I said, wait, the restaurant business looks really fun. Let me get into that. So that's a transition that got me into the restaurant business nice. and, yep. and transition then into food service. All right. Well, so let's dissect this a little bit because uh, you've given us such a wild ride already. I'm so thankful for this story. So what I want the reader or the listener to understand here is that 
not only did you try multiple things, but you hit on multiple things. Mm-hmm. And which is incredible. And it's not, not necessarily the story for everybody, but, but right. your story behind that is you took the chance, whether it was at five and a lemonade stand and moving it and getting more supply, or whether it was later taking a chance on, on the 10,000 first order when everybody else around you was saying, don't do it. And guess what? I believe that if you had not sold one of those wristbands, you would have given them away, I'm sure. And then you probably would have went and done another business. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I, I think when it comes to failure, obviously it's like the Facebook of our lives, right? Like nobody posts typically their bad day on Facebook in, in podcasts like this, or just in, in looking at somebody's journey from the outside and you see them being successful. It's like the old adage of the iceberg, right? Where you just see the tip of the iceberg. You don't see right. all the work that happens underneath all the preparation, all of the stuff that goes into what makes a successful, um, entrepreneur that's under the water, under the surface. And so for me, the biggest advice that I can give to other entrepreneurs they're trying to build is just don't make the big mistake. It's okay to make mistakes, but you want to be calculated, right? And you want to know, you always do want to make sure that you balance yourself with what is the worst case scenario. Okay. Yep. I knew when I bought those 10,000 wristbands, if I sold zero, I wasn't taking out credit to buy those. I I had that money. And so it wasn't going to put me in a situation where I was going to have to file for bankruptcy if I didn't sell this. So I think it's um, along the way, it's okay to take risks and you have to take risks. It's no different than playing blackjack. If you don't double down every time you have an 11, guess what? You're not leaving with any money, right? That's the only way you're going to leave with any money. I think the same thing is true in business. You have to take risks, but they have to be calculated. And as long as you don't, um, make the big mistake, then it's okay. And you're going to make a ton of little mistakes along the way. And yeah. we don't have enough time. You'd have to have me on for 17 sessions in a row right. for me to tell you all the mistakes that I've made in my, yeah. you know, 15 year yeah. journey. Here. Yeah. So on that note, I'm glad you went there because obviously uh, if, if the listener here, if this is not their first show listening, they know that I like to go through good decision, bad decision. And so you've given us some really good decisions of risk-taking, following a market, getting in on something when maybe it was early. I'm sure there are some really good decisions that you've made past that in some of your bigger businesses, but what about the bad decision? What did you make that that didn't work? Sure. So um, on the, the silicone wristband business, I came up with an idea. I had about three or four national competitors that I was competing with at the time. And it just so happened that a competitor and I came up with the same idea at the same time for a new product. And this was back when the iPods were real big. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you remember, um, iPods had the little click wheel on them. So what we came up with was we used the same silicone that we used to make our wristbands and we made covers for iPods. And then we could, you could put different colors of the silicone. So my idea was I was going to collegiately license these. So I made some really cool ones. If your mascot was the tiger, I made them black and gold and white, and they were swirled and looked like tiger stripes. And then I would put your logo on the click wheel. If you were the Nebraska Cornhuskers, we could make a bright red one with the Husker on the click wheel. And so my idea was people are going to want to buy these. They're going to want to cover up their iPads, uh, iPods and, and have their logo on the click wheel and do all this. So we spent a decent amount of money developing this product. And then we went out to start collegiately licensing this and getting this out into the marketplaces on the campuses. My competitor came up with the exact same product at the exact same time. Wow. Okay. And this gives you an example of two products identical, but marketed differently. Okay. So I go the collegiate licensing route. Yeah. He goes complete custom customization route. So think okay. Nike ID when you used to sure. be able to make your sneakers, however you wanted, right? Yeah. yeah. Pick your shoelaces, pick the colors, <clears throat> pick all of those different things. Yeah. So he allowed customers to buy one at a time off his website. They could pick what color they wanted. They could customize them. Yeah. His product, which is exactly the same as mine, he ended up selling so many of these. He re- he branded himself and he ended up selling that business for over $40 million. Wow. And his product ended up in all the AT&T retailers all over the country. It became like iPhone cases, right. all this kind of stuff. It's still a product today that you can go buy at, at your AT&T store. Wow. Mine, I couldn't sell enough. We couldn't get into the stores. With the exact same product, we had trouble getting the licensing, we had trouble getting into the stores, we had trouble getting traction. So it ended up being a product that we ended up saying, hey, we're spending too much on this. 
and you let we're going to have to pitch this and, and move on. It ended up being yep. one of those things that you just let go die in the entrepreneurial graveyard. Okay. Yep. yep. And uh, so that's a great example. So we, that's the, we literally had the same product. He made $40 million. I lost about $30,000. Okay. <laughs> so it's I mean, a $40 it million dollar swing, my friend. <laughs> yeah. It goes to show you though, that that was a great lesson for me and in, in my journey and, and granted it didn't kill me. Like I said, once again, don't make the mistakes that kill you. That didn't kill me, but it certainly was an opportunity cost that, that I lost by attacking that opportunity in the wrong way. Yeah. And I think probably, so if you're taking notes here, what I'm hearing Adam say is not only just don't take the risk that kills you, right? Because some risks you have to take and some of them come close to killing you. I think every entrepreneur has been close to dying. But here's the reality is that <clears throat> there's a formula to thinking worst case scenario, best case scenario that I'm hearing him talk about. And if, even in the midst of that, there's competition, there's other things in the market, there's supply chain issues right now, there's COVID stuff, there's this, that, and the other, there's labor shortages going that, that you have nothing to do with, quote unquote, as an entrepreneur in today's world. And so- from a bad decision perspective, what he's saying really is try your darndest to make the good decisions when you can. So that way the external factors like this case right here, he just picked the wrong thing, not knowingly necessarily, but it didn't kill him. It didn't have to kill him because he had made a lot of other really good choices. Right. He built himself a buffer inside of his business because it wasn't just risk, 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 risk. It was, let me make good choices repeatedly over and over. So that way, when I do make the risky choice and it goes wrong, it doesn't kill me. That's how you survive entrepreneurship. You don't actually die. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So you've given us so much, dude. I want to transition here a little bit to, to the speed round because uh, I know we're going to, these are supposed to be one word answers, but I know we're going to get into this a little bit in your business. So I know there's a couple of businesses right now, and you haven't even talked about really your two main businesses, your right. two main businesses being food service to the fraternities. Like you mentioned, you've got 500 plus employees like this is a crushing business right now. In addition to that, you and I have had some awesome talks about short-term rental stuff and, and just real estate. And, and you have a huge long-term legacy play when it comes to real estate. And I just, we are so like-minded in that way. When it comes to those businesses, if you could track one metric forever and ever, you can only pick one. What do you pick? For me, balance. I think that I can't be right in my business if I don't have the right balance in my life. And so okay. I'm constantly looking at that as the barometer because in all honesty, like my businesses are super important to me. It's I have a work family, just like I have right. a family at home. Nothing, nothing that I do in business or everything I do in business rather pales in comparison to my job as a husband and a father and, and, and what I do with my family. And so I think that just always having that balance and making sure that my priorities are right. Honestly, that's the metric that I use most in my life. And I believe that if you have that, it just clears your head for all of the other decisions that you need to make uh, in your business, because you're growing it for the right reasons and you're, you're investing in it for the right reasons. And so that for me is really the staple. And then once it gets into the actual business, if you want to transition into there, I think finding what in my business, we call it our prime costs. Okay. okay. And so uh, every business has a different prime cost for my food service business that prime, the prime costs are food and labor. Those are right. my big That's expense lines. Yep. And so I'm always tracking on a daily basis. Where are we at on our prime cost? Because for me, if our prime costs are in line, then we're going to be profit. Everything else is going to shake out. And so I think with the real estate business, it's the same way. When you go into an opportunity, Yep. You're evaluating what is my position going to be in this property? Is, is this going to be a successful venture? And you're always looking at those prime areas or those two or three main points that, that are the part of your, I've seen entrepreneurs, they get caught up in the minutia. Yeah. Okay. And they lose sight of the fact if you're chasing down, and I'm not saying that the cost, let's just take like insurance, for instance, if you take six weeks trying to negotiate with an insurance carrier about your insurance costs, but you take your eye off of how much you're spending on labor and food and all this kind of stuff, you've completely lost focus of what's going to make your business profitable. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to get the best price on your insurance. You should. Right. Uh, but I think it's all about prioritizing and figuring out yeah. in your business, what are the two or three key metrics yep. that are going to make you profitable and track them all the time, weekly the time. at minimum, but yep. daily if you can. No, it's huge. Um, okay. So you've said several things here. I'm going to come back to your original metric because 
Wow. Uh, we're going to come back to that. For, we have to. They're, 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 the, the Gathering of the Kings podcast is exactly what you've just said, which is we have to be able to boil it all down to the entire kingdom, which isn't just the business. It's business, family, all the other things that we're made for. So all of it to say, let's go back to your metrics here, because this is exactly how I've done my, my franchise uh, business. And then, then now getting into real estate as well. You pick your two or three main, what he called prime costs. And these are the things that you hone in on. Everything else you still want to pay attention to and shake down, but it has to be able to be broken down into two or three main things that you're really tracking. This is exactly what I've done as well. And I would even give you an, an example here. This past week, I met a, a real estate investor and he's, he's flipping. And he told me that he has, he's on week three of trying to find a stove for this unit. And I'm thinking in my brain, like, a stove, three, four, five, six, a thousand bucks. I can't imagine that the stove is really, you can't find one. What's the issue? And he's like, no, I can't find one that fits my $300 budget. I can find one right now that's for 600 bucks. And I literally across the table said, buy the $600 stove and move on because the time that you have spent trying to save $300, you could have done another deal or you could have been thinking at a bigger play, really. He was just so stuck in the minutia, like you were saying, of I got to find the deal, I got to find the deal, I got to find the deal, as opposed to valuing his time, really. So all of the value of the time circles way back, Adam, to what you're talking about with your family. So let's crack that just for a half second here. Why has for you for so long, your family, being a husband, being a dad been as important? Because we all say that it is, we want it to. But for you, it sounds like it has been and you've prioritized it. So for the guy that's listening or the lady, who believes the same thing that you say, but they're having troubles getting there. How do they prioritize it? How have you prioritized it so that you can actually be balanced? I think that as we talk about the kingdom and we talk about being a king and all these things, I think it's a great analogy. I think you're doing great things with this. But for me, it starts with, with saying to myself, okay, I'm going to follow in my life. This is my philosophy. Yeah. I'm not actually going to be the king. I'm going to follow the king of kings. You know what I mean? Love I'm going to live my life in a way that is going to represent my faith. And so I think that when you start there and you truly do live that I'm third attitude of God first, others second, I'm third. And, and, and in others, that includes your family and that includes your friends and that includes your business partners and all your of the team. other people in your life yeah. and really putting yourself there. That puts you in a position of leadership that is just so much different. And I think it allows people to look at you and say, Hey, there's something different about that guy. What is different? And then when you're blessed to have success, then it puts you on this stage where people are without you even necessarily wanting it, they're looking at you and they're saying, I'm going to watch that guy. What, what's he doing? How is he being successful? And so I think that's one of my main goals in life is just to make sure that when people are looking at me, when I don't even know they are, what are they seeing? What do they see? Do they see a guy that is just so driven in business? That's all he cares about. And he's willing to do things unethically to get it done. Or do they see a guy who truly has a great balance in his life? And that's a great example for what we should all strive to be. And let me tell you something. I, I fail every single day, every week, every month, because I think that pursuit of what I'm pursuing, perfection, yeah, it, it's impossible. And, and, and that's the reason why faith is so cool for me, because we don't have to be perfect. That, that's what's amazing. So I think that that to me is the foundation that, that's built that. But it doesn't mean that that you can't be a really successful entrepreneur. And it doesn't mean that you can't go get them. It doesn't mean you yeah. can't have this like this hunger to to be successful and to do the best you can. It just you have to be doing it for the right reasons. And it can't be all about building your own kingdom. Yeah. You got to make sure that as you grow how can you impact other people around you? Whether it's the 500 employees that I have influence over every day, like how can I positively impact their lives beyond just them cashing their paycheck? What can I do in my community now, right? Now that we found success, are, are there areas in the community that, that I can help with for, for people who aren't as fortunate? So I think that that is really um, a cool change in my life in the last few years that's happened is just the ability to be able to look at that. And I think it's okay if that's a goal that you have, because as you're building, you may not be in a position to be able to do that yet. And that's okay. But I think as long as you're building for the right reasons and you know that when you make it uh, to that place, that's going to be something you're going to want to do. I think that's a really cool, really cool way to do it. Because you can, there's so many ways you can do stuff without money. You can yeah. give back without money. So 100%. I think that the, the finances and all that is awesome, but there's a lot of ways that you can give back without having it be purely financial. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's a spirit really. It's a, it's an attitude of servitude and being a servant as a leader 
Uh, obviously, there's a great book, Servant Leadership, that that kind of breaks us down a little bit as well. But yeah, to your point, the picture of the kingdom doesn't just have the business, it has the family, it has the whole entire thing. But even bigger than that, which you gave, which I love, and I totally agree with, is that the idea really is, is that all the kings eventually take off their crowns, right, unto the king of kings, as you mentioned. And so I love that perspective. We share a lot of commonality there. So if you're listening right now, the uniqueness of the story that he's building is because of his design, his purpose, who he is as a son, who he is as a king, son meaning uh, a son of the king. And that perspective of sonship leads you to great gratitude and thankfulness and, and being able to then go out beyond what it is that we think we need for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that to get yours, but to have the influence, the community, the team, the family, all of that is, is really a larger part of what we're designed for. So thank you for sharing that with us. And two last questions. If you could recommend a book right now to a six-figure owner, practically one that you just got so much value from, what would it be? Man, that is a great question because I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. When I was in college, I had to use cliff notes every single time. So I'm going to be one of these weird entrepreneurs that I do a ton of reading. I don't do a, a ton of reading books, which I know is going to be surprising to people okay. because yeah. I think that most successful entrepreneurs do read books and I would encourage people to. When anytime I do get a chance to read a book, it's a positive thing for me. I'm always sure. learning. Uh, for me, most of my learning has been honestly grabbing on to other people that have had success. And, and instead of necessarily reading their book, it's like, trying to get a hold of them and say, Hey, can I have coffee with you? Can I have lunch with you? I want to learn. I want to learn what you've done and what's been successful. And I liken it to driving. If you're driving down the road uh, with a blind fold on and you have somebody on the passenger seat with you that's telling you when to turn and, and, right. and how to miss these potholes and in entrepreneurship sometimes it is we literally in a new business put on a blindfold yep. and we just go and we start yep. driving down the road and so if you can figure out a way to not be doing that alone all the time and yep. do that with mentors and peers and things like you're doing here Chaz to, to, uh, to, to be able to listen to podcasts and, and hear from other people that have had success and I, that to me um, at this stage in my life has replaced the book it might have something to do with three Three kids, nine, six, and two. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That by the time I get them to bed every night, it's man, I just it's time for me to go to sleep or go do a few more emails before I hit the sack. So that's right. That's right. No, I agree with that. All right. So last thing for today, Adam, you've given us so much value. If you lost it all, I mean, you have. If we're talking about kingdoms, you, your kingdom is pretty big. If it all fell apart today and you had literally nothing tomorrow, what do you do? Well, I think that ultimately is what drives most entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, the idea that we could lose it all at any moment is oftentimes what keeps us from ever losing it all. Right. I think that if you don't have a little bit of that in your gut every day that you could potentially lose it all, you're probably not pushing the envelope hard enough. And you're okay. probably not working quite hard enough in, in that journey. And you found yourself in a really comfortable position. And maybe later on in your life, when all of your investments are passive, maybe that's the place you want to be when you're sipping a margarita on the beach and, and this whole journey is behind you and you're just reaping the rewards of it. Great. But I think if you're not worried about losing it all, I think that's a place that you should be as an entrepreneur. And of course, I'm not encouraging you to lose it all. But if it had go back to what I said before, it would be disappointing. You would, but at the end of the day, it's like getting knocked out in the ring. You're going to, you're going to pick yourself back up and you're going to go back out there and try to find that next idea to, to take care of your family. And it sure helps when your identity isn't tied up in that. And I had a great lesson in that not too long ago. I sold my last restaurant that I had to be able to do the food service company full-time and really focus my efforts there. And I was really worried. Like, I think a lot of good entrepreneurs, we struggle with humility and, and ego. And I was just worried about what's the community's perception of me basically closing or selling this. And, and what I found out afterwards was nobody cares. These things are so much more important to us to than us. they are to anybody yep. else. And so I think that if you do lose it all, like, I just don't think that anyone should be that worried about what the perception is of that. I have a business partner right now in one of my businesses that, that came in as a partner of ours, and he's a billionaire. And guess what? He went bankrupt already once, and, and he's a billionaire again uh, for the second time. And so stories like that, you just have to pick yourself back up and make adjustments the next time. And I, I think that's what I would do. And, and if your focus is in the right place and your identity is not tied up 100% in your business, then guess what? You're going to you're gonna have a life to go home to, even if you lose your business and, and you're going to have a support system to be able to help get you back on your feet. 
I love it. Love it. Okay, Adam, thank you so much for someone who's listening today that has just resonated with you and they want to connect with you. And uh, maybe they want to maybe they want to connect with you in business somehow or become one of those uh, one of those partners. Um, how do they sure. connect with you? Sure. Our business, our primary business is called Upper Crust Food Service. And so that's how people could find us online. And then my email is uh, probably the best way to get a hold of me. Super easy. It's just my name, Adam, at uppercrustfoodservice.com. Easy enough. Okay, guys, if you're listening, guys and gals, if you're listening today, you may want to go back a couple of times. You could probably listen to this episode another six or seven times and not get everything Adam said. And so he really dropped some wisdom on us today. And so thank you so much for coming and doing that and taking the time out of your precious day uh, for doing that for everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sure. It's been great. Congratulations on all of your success with the podcast and everything else you're doing. I think it's great to, to encourage other entrepreneurs. And that's the last thing I'll say before I go is this is not a competition when it comes to entrepreneurship. Let's support each other because everybody's at a different place in their journey. And I, I love rooting on other people that are that are in their journey. And, and so I think there's enough business out there for everybody and we can all have that mindset. A hundred percent. That's abundance speaking from the core. I love it. Thank you so much, Adam. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Gathering the Kings. We hope you got a ton of value today and learned a thing or two about taking your business to seven figures and beyond. If you desire more and want a community around you to help you get there, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. That's gatheringthekings.com. And I want you to apply for our next Becoming a King 90-Day Intensive. We are extremely exclusive by nature as a group. What that means is that we're really wanting only the entrepreneurs who take their business and targets super serious to apply. So if that's you, you think you got what it takes to level up your business, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com and apply. And we will see you on the other side.